Hello. So <clears throat> I'm going to start off by saying that I'm assuming a few things, three in particular. I'm assuming my audience is primarily those interested in exploring methodologies for a particular educational research project, whether you're postgraduate researchers or what. Secondly, anyone who can talk as if they have full understanding of phenomenology is probably a professional philosopher. I seriously doubt that I'll ever be able to grasp phenomenology. And then the third assumption is about values and beliefs regarding human, human sciences and complexity in general. So I've got a pretty rigid com <clears throat> um, commitment to complexity and the phenomena that I'm trying to explore, which washes back in terms of the way that I think about them as well and the way that I research them. So what is a person is um, important because I'm interested in learning and that is a human thing. As much as we might talk about machine learning, really we know that that's wrapped up in algorithms and storing data ones and zeros. So if we think for a minute about what a human is, I know the socio-materialists among you will take a similar view derived from, I'm not quite sure what, but <clears throat> I've got to the bit in Gadamer where he talks about prejudice and the inevitability of them and that they're not always bad. So there are good and bad prejudices. It's important to have the good ones. I'll say a bit more about that later. But there is a primordial radical historicity of our being, uh, he argues. And as researchers, forget about the informants now, uh, the significance of good as opposed to less good traditions and how they play out gets to be quite important. So unlike... <clears throat> actor network theory or some others uh, post-human stuff uh, my way out of the Descartian dualism of mind body is through the ancient Jewish stance on how humans are constituted as radical unity of soul body there's still something uncanny about humans which is Heidegger's term learning included so those are insights from what's called ontological or, and or interpretive or hermeneutic phenomenology. Let me try to explain a little bit about transcendental or descriptive phenomenology as philosophy. Many of you will have heard that Husserl is the father of phenomenology, so it makes sense to try and understand what Husserl had to say. Yeah, I make a lot of use of audiobooks, especially for really dense texts. It's been very important for me. I chip away at them every day on a dog jog these days. Um, in fact, um, you, you probably want to see the dog, don't you? So, Husserl's, this is Boise. Um, Husserl's Ideas was published in 1913. Uh, it represents an attempt to describe lived experience before it's reflected on or theorized about at all. The book takes 17 hours of listening and is replete with technical terms without which it's almost impossible to comprehend. The only thing I really took from this first pass of Husserl from those 17 hours is that I needed to a sound grasp of words like noema, nomatic, noemata, the noetic, etc., apophantic, Thetic, you get the idea. So I'm trying to read Gadamer's Truth and Method, the actual book. But before I go any further, let's go back to basics with Dan Zahavi. So strictly speaking, phenomenology means the science or study of the phenomena. Oh, is that OK, right? Well, it were so simple. But we can all go home now. Um, it's a really short book here, actually, it's just 10 pages, so um, yeah, fantastic. Um, back to Gadamer, <clears throat> who uses a few more than 10 pages. Uh, this is part two. Um, I came to this a little while ago. I'm on a 300 or something. Um, I'm trying to read two pages a day. The extension, this is part two, the extension to the question of truth to understanding in the human sciences. So this is really meaty, important stuff. 
and we read this Latin thing, which I had to look up, of course, because I don't really have Latin. Um, shall we just read the English? <laughs> he who does not understand the things cannot draw sense from the words. And you think, why wasn't that on the cover? <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> then you have things like this. Um, now, 2017 was a, the great year of my moving through an ethnographic approach, which I kind of started liking, um, to a fundamentally phenomenological approach in my thesis research. I really liked the humanistic values and holistic methods of ethnography, but I realized that my research question was less about discovering cultural patterns than understanding individual experiences. So it wasn't great. And yet that was a, quite a seminal moment um, for me. But a lot of us are like, you know, just tell me what to do um, and I'll do it. <laughs> You know, so, so um, some people say about phenomenology that finds you as much as you find it. And in the moments after my supervisor said, I think Heidegger is a great place to start. It really helped me to stop flirting with the different Warren portals and get stuck in. But my supervisor's advice at the time was really sound. You don't need to become an expert in these authors to successfully complete a PhD. You just don't or perhaps any other research project apart from a philosophy department one. I'm an IT lecturer, you know, <laughs> that's it. And yet the mystique around that is really quite absurd. Uh, there is a mystique. I usually tell people that expert is a relative term. Okay, so can, I, can you please, you know, take back some power here. So you may well have better insight and you could do a far better job than me with this presentation if you're listening. Anyway, here we are. I'm doing it. <clears throat> so what kind of use can we put phenomenology to in the context of educational research? Fair question. Before I can answer that, I need to point out that phenomenology is contested ground, uh, especially when you try to apply it. So these three have been writing fairly polemic articles and even books rubbishing each other's approaches. I don't think that's too strong a term. I find John Paley a little bit too acrid. It sounds like he wrote it into a microphone screaming, walking around the house. Um, interpretive phenomenological analysis. That's Jonathan Smith on the right there. Um, it's quite popular in health sciences where they want to do qualitative research into lived experience, the patients experiencing things like that. I attended a workshop about this in 2014. I found it quite alien in the way that it treats the data which emerged from just a few interviews. Um, good work can come from these approaches, I think. But Max has been going for a long time and I have to admit a lot of what he says chimes with me. A paper by Jacobs, which I recommended for this session, is straight out of Max's methods. Max talks about the importance of going back to the original sources as they can be powerful, what he calls insight cultivators. And I really have to agree with that. That's an excellent term I'll, I've kind of adopted. Now, that doesn't mean to say that we should be able to understand everything that these insight cultivators say. Um, and they don't even have to be really obtuse people, you know? but it does mean that they can jar or inject us in or inject into us, push us into a different space in our thinking. Um, whether you buy the approaches of these three guys on the screen or the arguments that sustain them, at very least, anyone who's trying to re do research about experience or perception has to cross the threshold of phenomenology to some extent. So to give you some examples of insights that they have cultivated for me, um, especially Heidegger, um, I'll try and do that a bit and relate it to my own research in my PhD. So the picture in the middle there is of me um, helping midwives partition out these um, tablets, which were really cheap. Um, and this all links back to a question I have about what makes us differ in our 
attitudes and capabilities towards IT. Of course, there's an absolute myriad different factors, but some people are really good with IT and others are really fine and others not first at all and others absolute disasters. Um, I wanted to approach the phenomenon of IT use from the inside in case this would afford answers. And I came up with the question, what's it like to be a healthcare student with a mobile phone? That's hopelessly broad, but <clears throat> what is it like questions implicate phenomenology. Now I've been associated with network learning for a long time as well. So I need to put in a word for about that. You know, network learning research can get quite excited about you know, measuring the connections the world has gone digital, hasn't it? And so that's, again, ones and zeros. And so there's connections and nodes and things like that and data moving about. Um, but you can lose sight of the organic world with all its messiness and unpredictability and view people in that setting non-dualistically, um, I think is important. As soul body phone, <laughs> um, which I guess is is slightly ant-informed, but I have this commitment to try and stay faithful to the organic complexity of what's going on, and thus we have this concept which I came up with, which is mobilage, or you can sort of say it if you want, but I've tried to use the phonetics there to help people, it is a blend word formed from these three little bits of idea. So, um, yeah, that was pretty early on um, in, in 2017 that I that came up with that, I think it was. Um, so you can't really see phenomenology implicated there, but it's still got the same kind of commitments, as I said, the same values, I believe. Um, nobody's picked me up on that yet. <clears throat> I'm trying to write a paper right now about, <sighs> so hard. <laughs> about how we can use theory to preload consciousness as we proceed with the research project. It's a bit like uh, the ethnographic gaze. Have you heard of that? Everyone attempting ethnography says you have to have it, but no one can tell you how to get it apart from having a go. Um, because in the process of data gathering, encountering the phenomenon, trying to analyze or represent it, how do I know I'm looking at it right? All right, so, so well, referring back again to Gadamer, who says it's, you know, we have these prejudices, we just have to try and make sure they're the right ones. Well, I'm arguing that we could use things like mobilize to preload our consciousness. So that allows me to avoid being distracted by the technology or the person, and also to sort of make sure that I haven't forgotten learning. Um, so there's always a danger in research that involves technology and uh, learning is actually the hard bit that's forgotten. And we run off and made learning better, but we haven't really thought about what learning is. And I do find it annoying when people are very passe in there and they just sort of move over without being arrested. And I guess held in a state of wonder about the phenomena of learning itself. People might claim to be phenomenologists, but if they just brush off learning as just yeah, you know, uh, something that happens, um, they've rushed on too fast and they haven't been true to the phenomenological attitude, I think. Um, so the point is I'm viewing the mobilage as a fluid system, very much held up um, in the air by different practices, by context, ecology, society, time. Um, <clears throat> this helps me to cling to a sense of the complexity of what's going on. Um, and as I try to encounter this phenomenon, as I'm researching it. So let's take a Heideggerian phenomenological lens to mobilize. And there it is on the left, we have ready to hand. It's just doing its thing uh, straightforwardly, um, not even really aware of it, except it is definitely about, we're picking it up to check something, we're putting it back down again, we're just checking the time. Oh, there's an alert. Mm. Right now, uh, Heidegger classically uses um, a a cobbler's hammer uh, to describe to to to, to analogise around um, this change in the way that this 
thing um, presents itself to us, so it reveals itself. Um, so what I did with, in my thesis, you can read the passage, whatever page it is, um, I said, well, just a minute, <laughs> the phone is a bit different beast to the hammer. Um, you've got the hammer is a pretty stable thing. It was still a hammer when Heidegger was talking about it. It's still a hammer today. It's used for bashing things. Um, so it hasn't evolved at all. I might have to hurry up through this. But um, there's also this multitasking thing. So it could be both ready to hand and present to hand at the same time. Um, the squiggles around it, I should have said, mean um, that it's now misbehaving. Um, it's doing something, it's asserting itself into our consciousness and making us aware of something, maybe not itself, but maybe aware of its presence in a way, you know, it rises in consciousness in a way that it hadn't before and it was just doing its, doing what we are, routinely did, uh, what we were expecting it to. So in all these ways, um, and you can read the passage in my thesis if you really want to, but I'm... Um, I think I'm out of time to talk about it very much. Um, you have, um, yeah, the phone is really in a different category um, as far as this is concerned. So this is how I've taken a sort of post-phenomenological analysis of the technology, but I would also that phenomenological thinking started to infuse everything that I was doing um, as I was working on the research, for example. So I, I've shunned transcripts uh, as they are in my view radically different to the encounter with mobilage that happened at some distant date in the past you've got a transcript great but that's not the experience that you had when you met that person with their phone so i was also different every single time i looked at anything certainly every time i come to a transcript i'm a different person i've moved on in time there's something kind of static about the text, is there? But um, that's okay. So <laughs> before I get into an existential crisis or tip you lot into it, um, I probably should move to the next slide. But to point out that another metaphor, I think, for this aspect of the work is a kaleidoscope. Uh, what's important about this picture is that it's a real one, not a computer generated graphic. You're looking down a 2D tunnel, if you all had this experience, at the same, t same lumps of refracting plastic falling about, and the pattern is never identical. It is never identical. It's always wonderful. You know, they are mesmerizing, aren't they? Because although the words in the transcript don't change again, time passes, right? And this is, this is like a metaphor for what's going on there. Your consciousness is constantly churning and the experience can never be repeated in exactly the same way twice. Going back to my attitude towards written transcribing and transcripts, this is a little bit controversial. <clears throat> Even if the text stays put, you change. Now, these are aspects of distanciation, I think, which is the distance between text and speech. And that's Paul Ricoeur, especially in building on Gadamer, I think, hermeneutic phenomenology. So there were a host of Heidegger's ideas I don't have time to go into, for example, um, which I've just been um, <sighs> impacted by uh, such a thrownness and being and care, um, care structure. But when I got lost, I found myself reaching out to Ma Max, Max van Manen uh, to somehow stabilize these ideas. Now you can see what a benefit probably it is um, to come at phenomenology from one stable like Max's in the paper um, that I've got and some of the people contributing to our Hanford event um, they uh, everything is just done quite neatly and and they just do a great job um, out of that stable um, in Alberta there um, with Kathy Adams and such but I did I did lean on Max uh, his ideas um, as I went through to try and get myself out of a sticky patch. So this is um, phenomenology of practice uh, and so that as a method uh, came 
in quite late on to guide, especially the vignette work, which I was doing, but it really helped to clarify some of the uh, approaches to that. So we're talking there about analysis through writing and rewriting and rewriting and reflecting, and rewriting. And, um, and so I ended up with this uh, kind of thing, um, showing you on the next slide there. Um, so, I mean, I could just read this, but actually it's going to take a while. So <laughs> I'd love to read it to you, but I don't have time. And you can perhaps uh, see a link here um, with what Jacobs does in the online dating paper, which I'm not really going to dwell on because it ain't my work. But nonetheless, I do think it's really good. Um, one of the ideas that's form that, that really helped inform this approach was uh, by Juice Van Loon. Um, again, that's going back to ethnography, really. And rather than um, representation, you know, speaking for, um, you're trying to acknowledge the agency of those people that you're speaking for. Um, but I'm doing, trying to do more than that uh, and, and actually return to presence. So re-presencing. And the question is, does, does this writing do that? Do you find yourself giving what some call the phenomenological nod to this account? Well, I hope that you do. Um, but um, I'm going to pass over a little bit further um, to present you with this little challenge then. Um, do you want the red pill or the blue pill? Which are you going to take? Are you going to um, switch off a bit, you know, curtail your values around complexity, or are you going to let them run riot and just, you know? So let's turn a little bit to the Jacobs article. Um, so, what this image is taken from. A film I really like. Um, it's a bit of a silly film, but it's not as silly as some, right? I think it's better than the superhero movies and stuff like that, actually, uh, into, on the silliness scale. So we got Ben Stiller, uh, and he's chasing, um, well, actually, his character is Walter Mitty, right? Uh, he's ch chasing someone called uh, Cheryl. And and there he is. Uh, now, unlike in the paper by Jacobs, um, Walter now is trying to post a wink to a lady he fancies whom he's already seen in real life in his office, but he ha hasn't got the bottle to actually do it. And this is not quite the same situation that you get in Jacobs, where it's very much about um, the fact that um, people have only met online and um, and then they get to connect in real life. So, but this does make a related point. <laughs> okay, so to some of Jacob's stuff about um, self-revelation online and how thin the communications are compared to in real life. And we, I think we can forget that. Um, so they, you know, online does, allow us to do this. You know, here we are in the same space, are we? It's a weird kind of anonymity that you get, though. I don't really know all of you and such. You know, how do we do that? There's this kind of veiling and surveilling. You could be staring at my freckle or something all the whole time. I haven't really got one there just to say, okay, don't need to stare there. <laughs> you can stare at lots of the things if you want. But I can relate it directly to an experience that has haunted me for years. Uh, back in 2002, I joined the CSALT module on network learning, and they designed the whole program on a timeline that meant each module, students would meet each other online first, asynchronously. So it was all through um, discussion forums. And then came the residentials, so like two weeks later. Um, they were far and away the best aspect of the learning teaching strategy, but served to highlight the richness of embodied co-presence and the thinness of the virtual. Albeit telepresence, um, as good as it can get, um, I really hope um, that you get that from this article. I think it relates to the work we're currently doing with Kathy Adams to write a phenomenology of Zoom breakout rooms. 
we hope to do some of that work with delegates to the event that we're running in June, and then hopefully uh, presenting a paper on it next um, spring. So in the network learning conference, and hopefully an edited book after that, or uh, at least. Um, so one of the things that I do like about the phenomenology of practice approach is the sense that I get that its heart is in the right place. It's not claimed to be philosophy, explicitly not, but it does prioritize wonder. And I don't, whether you can identify whether phenomenological attitude suits you or whether you suit it, or if it's just too uh, sort of weird. <laughs> I, I've got this, <laughs> I probably, um, I'm quite tempted to set this going just so you can see the guy's face, but it's not gonna play, I don't think. No, it's not going to play properly. Oh, no, there he is. Okay. There's Malcolm tight. Okay. I'll just leave it there. And if you do Google him, um, <laughs> it's a little bit intimidating. Uh, he's, um, this is, this is, he's, he's written a paper about phenomenography. And if Malcolm writes a paper about something, uh, you can bet it's backed by an awful lot of scholarship. Um, so from some of the stuff that he says in it, uh, which I only became aware of the other day, um, which shows the worth of even going to the fun events uh, that CTEL organize, uh, it, he takes a little pop at phenomenography um, and, and this observation, right? So I should just say that Markham Tite was my internal examiner for my thesis a couple of years ago. Uh, my big mistake was to watch this video before my Viva. Now, in, in the event, I really enjoyed the Viva, I have to say. And, you know, there was good repartee, actually. And I'll never forget um, the exchange. He probably will, but I won't. Um, so <laughs> I could tell you about that another day. But anyway, um, so he's... <laughs> If phenomenology is only expecting, as it says in the highlighted bull text there, um, if, if phenomenology is expecting to only find a limited number of ways of perceiving, understanding, or experiencing phenomena, I find that cuts against the grain. Um, I think that threatens wonder. I want to get drunk on complexity. You know, wonder is one of the watchwords of phenomenology. <clears throat> And you just think, well, what is that then? Um, just, just have a think about, what, there's a nice guy, um, me in a state of wonder, I think. But how different from amazement and curiosity and an admiration or astonishment or unsurprise uh, wonder is. And I really do need to finish up now, but I need to suggest that attending our event in June is a good idea and see the website to find out more. Um, so please subscribe to our YouTube channel and blog for updates. So, um, this Felicity, who's I think maybe on, on the call with us, and I've got some references for you uh, I can share. Um, There's just a handful there, but I don't know, maybe they'll be useful. I just need to at least give you some pointers as to some of the stuff I've been talking about. Um, where should I go next? Um, I probably don't have much time. Maybe back to the dog. Yeah. Hope that was okay. <laughs>